Just two brief introductions uh, of our two panelists. You know who they are. You can read more about them on the app or on the website, or uh, they'll stop you and tell, them all, to tell you all about themselves shortly. Kevin Rudd is the inaugural president of the Asia Society. Oh, we What's that? <laughs> no, we went. Okay. Asia Society Policy Institute. Of course, he was the Prime Minister of Australia and the Foreign Minister. Victor Cha is a professor at Georgetown. He's also a senior advisor to the Center for Strategic uh, CSIS, Center for Strategic, Strategic yeah, international and International Studies. studies. Lost. And uh, he also was on the National Security Council from 2004 to 2007. Uh, I was here two panels ago with um, Adam Hamilton, who's written a book about fear. Uh, in times of disruption, uh, and so we'll see if this panel will either be a balm to fear or create more of it. Um, Victor, let's start with the, um, the meeting between Kim Jong-un and President Trump. There have been, we've now had some time pass. How should we think wisely about what happened and where things stand? Um, <clears throat> so I guess the first thing I would say is that um, meeting is better than war. Uh, and uh, if any of you were following this issue this time a year ago, this time maybe a year ago, two weeks earlier, North Korea tested a ballistic missile on a lofted trajectory, which means they fired it basically straight up into the air. Uh, but then if you flattened out that trajectory, it, it showed that that missile could reach the continental United States. So, um, and the president was talking about fire and fury. So we were headed in a very bad direction. And so in that sense, a meeting between the two leaders is not a bad thing. I mean, there's still lots of details to be filled in, uh, but again, relative to where we were, it's not a bad place to be. Kevin, what's your assessment? Basically, I agree with Victor. It's um, Trump's style is unorthodox by anyone's definition. Um, he doesn't play by any diplomatic rule book that any of us are familiar with. But Trump's Trump, you guys elected him. <clears throat> so uh, uh, he's the president, and he's the one we've got to live with around the world. And so uh, his strategy, so far as I can work it out, is meet the guy, shake the tree, and see what falls out of it in terms of denuclearization, however we're subsequently going to define it, as opposed to go through a permanent set of preconditions for a meeting ever happening. And as Victor said, we're on a trajectory in a radically different direction as of the end of last year. So I think the jury is genuinely still out as to what that's going to yield. I think uh, the football's been passed to Mike Pompeo, who's on his way to Pyongyang next week. Am I right, Victor? Yeah, it looks like it. Um, and, uh, and this will be round one in terms of whether the North Koreans are faintly serious about the formulation they've used on denuclearization. Uh, and on that, I'd just say the language they used in the Singapore summit declaration uh, was just the same as we've seen in previous forms from the North Koreans. There's no advance in the language there. There's no greater, as it were, permission for North Korean negotiators to go further based on the, the summit language. It's the same old, same old language. In fact, it's weaker right. than some of the language we've seen before. Yeah. Yes, but talk about that weakness a little bit, Victor, the difference, because this is the big victory as it was claimed by the administration, this promise. So compare this promise, the language as it was written to previous language, and then uh, what might not have been written, uh, but what you read between right. the lines. So without getting too wonky about this, um, essentially uh, what was agreed to at Singapore was a very broad statement about denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula that really um, did not suggest any real responsibility on the part of the North Koreans to completely abandon permanently their nuclear weapons programs. They had made, made statements to that effect in two previous agreements, one, with, one that I worked on 10 years ago, the Six Party Talks, and then in 1992 they made a similar commitment to South Korea. Uh, but that was not what we saw in, in this statement, and that is, you know, that is obviously for those of us who look at this and understand that you know, meetings are nice, but the key thing is to make, our, make ourselves more secure uh, without a better definition from the North Koreans, even if we put the President of the United States in front of them, a meeting that they have been waiting for for 45 years, uh, to not get something more definitive from the North Koreans was clearly a disappointment. And Kevin, what would you be looking for? You say the football's been passed to Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State. Uh, so what's the next thing you would be looking for from his meetings? If uh, I was in the Secretary of State's position, and it's not an enviable place to be, uh, I think there are two uh, 
uh, things that should be worked on now. One's relatively easy, although it'll have its own complications, which is to sustain the, the atmospherics and the spirit of the summit. You do need to start to look at liaison offices in both capitals, uh, a US liaison office in Pyongyang and similarly one uh, in <coughs> DC. But at the more substantive level on the denuclearization front, I think if you're going to be talking about denuclearization, then the bottom line is we've got to know what we're talking about. So you will need, sooner or later, a formal declaration by the North Koreans of the totality of, the, let's call it, their nuclear capability from not just uh, missiles, not just nuclear material, but also the precursors and also the research facilities because that's what's going to be subject to a future verification regime if we get that far. So that's kind of step one. So that's the, basically the, everything that's in the cupboard, everything that's under a mountain, everything you've got, yeah. put it all on a list. And, and the liaison offices are important. Uh, I mean, maybe we all know why they're important, but one thing that, that you both have mentioned is meeting is better than war. And we saw these meetings go off track and then they got put back on track, which seemed amazing. From countries that weren't communicating at all, there was a level of a communication enough to to, and, and the liaison offices keep those communication lines open. Is that basically the biggest function? Well, Victor will know this better than myself because he's worked in the U.S. administration. I'm a foreigner. I've not done that. I've just worked with the U.S. administrations. <laughs> but the bottom line is if you're dealing through intermediaries uh, to get your message through to Pyongyang by one means or another, you're always going to run the risk of miscommunication. And the intermediary um, advertently or inadvertently uh, colouring the message. <laughs> Uh, whether it's through Seoul, whether it's through Beijing, or whether it's through, through other helpful intermediaries. So I think clarity of lines of communication, frankly, is pretty important. Um, but the meat and potatoes of it is actually getting the nuclear inventory right. right. Um, that's step one before you get down to uh, a process which defines the timetable of um, missiles, nuclear material, verification arrangements, et cetera. And the, Victor, and are they going to give that? Yeah, well, the, and just to, to put a slightly finer point on it, this was where the negotiation broke down last time. This is where the agreement broke down last time. And from 2005 to 2008, we got to the point where it was time for North Korea to give that declaration, and they did not give a real declaration. And Kevin's absolutely right. We can't start a negotiation on their nuclear weapons till they admit to what they have. <laughs> Right? because then we can't locate it, we can't get IAEA, inspector, International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors in to suspend activity, to seal things, to put cameras, to monitor these things. We can't do any of that unless we know what they have. So that piece, I think, is very important. And you know, on your question about the summit, I think some of us felt like if we're going to send the president 10,000 miles to Singapore for the first ever meeting with the North Korean leader, we hope we could get at least that. Right, and we weren't able to get that. And when you say that, you mean this inventory? This inventory, at least a commitment to buy the leader to that inventory. And when we, when the U.S. looks at the inventory, if it at all even is forthcoming, how good, well, a couple things. A, is there an item we know, look, if they put this on the list, they're serious about telling us what they actually have. And then, and then secondly, is our intelligence and our eyes into North Korea good enough that if we don't know specifically a thing that they would need to disclose to let us know they're serious, that we can pretty much match the list they give us with what we're able to actually know about. So where, the, where this all broke down the last time was not over their declaration of their plutonium-based weapons program, which has been in existence for actually a very long time and was the subject of two separate negotiations with the United States in 1994 and then the one I was in, participating in in 2005. It's the second program, which is a uranium-based program, which they uh, sought to acquire um, material for, I don't know, it must be now almost 18 years ago. That is a second program that was clearly in violation of the previous agreements. Now, initially, uh, when, when the the administration I worked for, the Bush administration, called North Korea on this and said, we've got you know, information that says you have a second program. They completely denied it. The New York Times, sorry if there are any New York Times reporters here, the New York Times said we were lying. Um, uh, yeah, really? Yes, they did, yeah. Well, this was Iraq, and, you know, so it was a different time. And, um, and then, lo and behold, five years later, the North Koreans admitted they had such a program, and now it's quite developed. Mm -hmm. and, and so 
that declaration would have to cover the entirety of that second program as well as the ballistic missiles and would have to match up with what our intelligence community thinks that they, that they, that they have. Are they, is there any chance they're gonna be that complete in their inventory? Um, right, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to imagine that right now, but then again, we never thought the two leaders would meet, yeah. right? and they did. Uh, and the North Koreans are doing things we haven't seen before. They've decommissioned their nuclear test site. They're going to return 200 POW MIA remains from the Korean War. There, there are things that they've done that we haven't seen before. So while I'm, you know, while I tend to be a little bit skeptical and wish we got more in the Singapore summit, I'm not willing to say, you know, we're not going anywhere right now because right. the alternative, as I said, is is terrible. Right? Yeah. So. Kevin, you, you said Pompeo's got the football. Who else is on the field or are U.S. allies in the region uh, in the stand somewhere and not, and not a part of this process to torture the metaphor? Well, being a, a U.S. ally with President Trump is currently a hazardous, ex hazardous experience. Uh, <laughs> you never quite know where you're going to stand when you pick up the phone of a morning or not pick up the phone. Uh, so the two relevant allies, of course, are the South Koreans and the Japanese. Uh, evidence, uh, A, of how problematic this is in Seoul is kind of in one direction, the unilateral decision to call the summit off, which then sent uh, South Korean President uh, Moon into a tailspin and to immediate into Korean summit with, his, with Kim Jong-un to try and get it back on the road, which they did successfully. Um, and then, uh, at the time of the Singapore summit itself, straight out of left field, literally, the unilateral statement by the President of the United States that uh, US South Korean military exercises were off. Now, the South Koreans knew nothing about that. Um, and uh, so there is a problem, a real problem, in political calibration of a script with this president. Then you've got the Japanese. And the Japanese, uh, I mean, Pr Prime Minister Abe, I think, on the earliest days of the Trump administration, believed he had a good working relationship with Trump. He did the uh, pilgrimage tour first, I think, to Trump Tower, and then a second pilgrimage tour uh, down to uh, Mar-a-Lago. Um, but I think he's found himself um, uh, in the bleachers as well uh, on the detail of these negotiations. So um, Pompeo and the, the rest of the foreign policy national security team, I think, will be acutely conscious of keeping these two on side, but they're going to be permanently as it were, compromised by uh, the Twitter sphere and what the president decides in a 24-hour period, often without reference to them. And Kevin, you've studied China a long time. Bring China into this equation and what you think its role was in bringing the summit about and where, it's, where it sits now in this metaphor. I think the Chinese, if you're sitting in Xi Jinping's office at the moment, there'll be a series of high fives about where it's all got to so far. Uh, and for these reasons, number one, you've had this really ugly relationship between China and North Korea going back, uh, well, nearly 10 years, I'd say, um, Victor, but getting progressively worse since the election of Xi Jinping, who regarded uh, Kim Jong-un as uh, disrespectful, uh, unappreciative young man uh, who didn't understand where his elders were, and China's traditional relationship with the North. And so the Chinese then packed into the UN Security Council sanctions, and despite the fact they didn't give full effect to those sanctions, the ones they signed up for and gave partial effect for were much more than they'd ever done before. And so the tonality of the relationship between the two of them, as of 12 months ago, as of six months ago, was very bad, historically bad, going back to the 50s, when they were comrades in arms against American troops and Australian troops and South Korean troops in the Korean War. So what happened as a result of this summit uh, is that suddenly uh, the political opportunity to normalize, uh, not just the relationship with Pyongyang has come about. You've now had three visits uh, by Kim Jong-un uh, to Beijing. We expe expect there'll be one by uh, Xi Jinping to Pyongyang fairly soon. So they, I think, see this as good. And then secondly, on the broader question, um, because the whole security temperature on the peninsula has now come down from China's strategic playbook, this is a good thing. And their final view, I think, will be, this is a 
interesting question for where this ultimately goes mm -hmm. and when, at what point does Trump seek to declare victory if he can is I think it's the ultimate Chinese strategic view that uh, it will be impossible given where we've got to for us to return to the earlier state of absolute military tension we got to at the end of last year. They think that things have now fundamentally changed. So from their point of view, this is all pretty good. And I, th I think that on this last point by Kevin about whether things have fundamentally changed, you know, on, on the one hand, there is this piece that matters the most to the United States, which is denuclearization. We don't want this country to have nuclear warheads and ballistic missiles that can reach any part of the United States, including Aspen, right? Um, um, but what the summit has set off, or what the series of summits have set off, as Kevin said, this North Korean leader six months ago had not, had not in seven years met any world leader at all. He'd not even left the country. And within the last six months, he's done three summits with the Chinese, two with the South Koreans, came to Singapore to meet the president. President Trump wants to invite him to the White House this fall. Um, the UN, my guess is the Secretary General of the UN will invite him to come and address the UN General Assembly in September. Just a complete change from where we were even six months ago. And Kevin's point about the atmosphere changing, my, the, the thing is here is the United States, we are focused, rightly so, on the missiles and the weapons. But this diplomatic process has started to create lots of momentum in the region towards let's end the Korean War. Right? This war has not, this is, this, is a, this is a war that was never finished in 1953. An armistice basically codified a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. And the war is not over. Um, and so I think probably the Chinese, the South Koreans certainly, are really trying to see if this can push in the direction of not just a denuclearization process, but also an end to the Korean War. What's the practical benefit of ending a war that hasn't been a, 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 a war for some so, time? So, um, so one, it's, it's peace, right? It's peace, which is better than war. The, but the other thing is I think some people believe that we have tried to do it for 25 years the other way, which is to focus solely on the weapons and try to say, if we get denuclearization, that opens up a path to everything else economic assistance, because this is a very poor country, um, um, uh, um, a peace treaty, normalized relations, because the United States does not have normal political relations uh, with North Korea. When I travel to North Korea as a US representative, we do not have an embassy there. Like, our protecting power is Sweden. So when I went there, I was met by five nor big, burly-looking North Koreans who told me to hand over my diplomatic passport and one Swedish ambassador. It wasn't comforting. It wasn't a fair yeah, fight. Yeah. <clears throat> um, um, uh, but then the others, and maybe the Chinese and the South Koreans feel this way, is that they're saying, that didn't work. I mean, it failed the last two times, so maybe what we should do is try to get peace first, and then see once there's peace and the North Koreans don't feel insecure, maybe they'll be more willing to give up their weapons. The American response to that is, if we make peace with them now, they will never give up their weapons. We will basically be accepting them as a nuclear weapon state. And so that is a debate, I think, that still is taking place within policy circles today. Kevin, I want to get your assessment of the, one of the criticisms of the summit uh, was that President Trump gave too much to the North Korean leader in terms of prestige, moral equivalency being on the stage with the American uh, president. A lot of people complained about the North Korean flag and the American flag being right next to each other. Um, how big is that cost? And if, you know, talks are better than war, uh, wasn't it a, a fine price to pay? Well, that invites the question, how, did, how has all this been seen from Pyongyang, just through their narrow lens? And this is not a normal state. It's a Leninist state. These guys are paid professionally to lie, okay? So the whole idea that this is kind of normal state-to-state -state relations or a normal political uh, establishment. It's just not like that. So looking at it from the point of view of a totalitarian, not an authoritarian, a totalitarian regime, what's been in it for them? One, uh, as Victor just said, uh, partial international legitimization, combination of flags, meeting the President of the United States, etc., and the general all-round high-fives surrounding 
uh, premature high fives, in my view, surrounding the atmospherics of the, of the summit. Two, domestic legitimization. We often forget that even in totalitarian regimes, you need legitimization as well. So the way in which this will be reported in uh, North Korean media uh, is that uh, finally as a result of Korea's, North Korea's nuclear weapons program, the dust of the Americans have been forced to meet with us uh, and in a weakened state, uh, here they came uh, and met with us finally on equal terms. They've come to their senses. Uh, silly people that they are, dot, dot, dot. So in terms of domestic political le legitimization, that'll be the message being sent through their media. And I think the other thing is, from their hard-nosed negotiating perspective, uh, they avoided in the four-part uh, Singapore declaration uh, any reference to CVID, uh, comprehensive, verifiable, irreversible disarmament. Um, they avoided that. Which was the previous language that had been often dis in these discussions. That's right. And so uh, that, therefore, is, has been avoided by the negotiators. So from the North Korean point of view, terrific. That gives them more flexibility to do very little in the downstream negotiations. So that's their third win, I think. And the fourth is, and Victor pointed this as well, is the atmospherics around the peninsula and more broadly will be in the direction of, notwithstanding that UN Security San Council sanctions will remain in place for the time being, you're going to see the Chinese increasingly, I think, give a very creative interpretation to that uh, and walk around it more. Uh, off the back of the new atmospherics, you'll see a new interpretation of the humanitarian provisions of the existing sanctions, which enable you to provide certain materials to the North for humanitarian reasons. So from their point of view, this isn't a bad outcome so far. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, did the United States give away too much? It depends ultimately on if you accept President Trump's strategy, which is shake the tree as hard as you can, and see what falls out of it once you've had a meeting, then we'll know whether he gave too much once um, Pompeo has been through rounds one, two, and three. And President Trump implicitly seemed to sort of say it was okay for the Chinese to not be pressing the sanctions too hard on North Korea in his remarks after the, uh, in the press conference before he came home. It's interesting watching the Chinese media on this question in recent days. Um, the Chinese uh, press has been saying that uh, countries should not rush to invest in North Korea. Whereas I think the internal message in China is uh, we're going to t increasingly turn a blind eye to Chinese firms becoming more active in, in North Korea. So the key question, to go back to Victor's earlier logic, is, is do we end up with a material advance on the listing of the nuclear inventory and a timetable to make it subject to nuclear, uh, to international verification against its removal? And Victor, what, I mean, I feel like we've read so much about how North Korean prestige is wrapped up in the nuclear program. Mm -hmm. What could North Korea be given uh, to get rid of its nuclear program? Um, frankly, I think there's nothing we can give them to get rid of their nuclear program. Um, they started landscaping the ground for this program in 1962 which was two years before the Chinese exploded a nuclear device. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have been, and they've devoted a good portion of their national resources since then to this program. And, December, and in December of last year, they said, we've accomplished our goal. So the notion that after all that time, they're suddenly ready to sit with President Trump or Secretary Pompeo and then push it all across the table and say, you know, normalized relations, peace treaty, these sorts of things. It's very hard for me to imagine. Um, however, this is not to say that the North Koreans don't want normalized relations, peace treaty, access to international financial institutions, the lifting of sanctions. They want all those things, but they want those things ultimately with some nuclear capability. In the end, they want to have their cake and eat it too, and that, of course, is at least for the past 25 years of U.S. negotiating strategy, that is, that is unacceptable. So, see, where I worry about this is cast our minds forward to uh, Pompeo in the field with whoever his North Korean counterpart's going to be, um, and Trump reading the reports, 
by year's end as we get to the midterms, beyond uh, the midterms. And that either the North Koreans don't move or they move incrementally in terms of eventually providing a, an inventory which may be partial or, or complete. But that the landing point they ultimately point to is this. Um, and that is that uh, we North Koreans could consider um, a moratorium um, and or uh, the removal of our ICBM capabilities, which are capable of targeting the continental United States. Uh, but we're not going to touch our short and medium range missiles, which, th which threaten South Korea, Japan and regional allies. And that President Trump, this is the scenario which many of the allies are concerned about, uh, looks at that and says, well, hot diggity, uh, that's not bad uh, because, um, because when I became president, uh, the North Koreans already had these regional capabilities, regional missiles, that is short to medium range missiles. They already had nuclear bombs. They were working on their miniaturization and there's a technical debate about how far that's reached. Uh, what's new is the ICBM testing, which uh, Victor pointed to before. So do we get to a stage where the overwhelming political temptation by the president is to declare victory on that, uh, leave the rest intact, and then leave the North Koreans very happy indeed, but with, um, I think, South Korea and certainly Japan in a much more <coughs> complex situation. So the president has already declared victory of a sort, and, and they have said complete denuclearization is the red line, essentially. Right. So this, uh, what Kevin's described basically is just monkeying with the language and redefining what the original red line was. Is that basically, do you see that outcome as the plausible one as well? I mean, I, I certainly worry about what Kev, the, the scenario that Kevin just described. I mean, that would be the United States basically decoupling uh, our security, our homeland security from the security of our allies. Um, it's not entirely an implausible scenario because if anything, this president has shown he doesn't really value very much our alliances, whether they are in Europe or in, or in Asia. Um, before you all saw what happened at the G7 summit, the G7 summit was just before his trip to Singapore. And if I was on his staff, I would have said, Mr. President, you want to get a good, strong statement from all your allies as you head into Singapore, um, just to show that everybody's with you on this. And you know, clearly, that's not what he did. Um, um, instead, picking a fight with Canada. Um, the, um, so I think I, I do worry about this because, as Kevin, this is a very unconventional president, and um, and he's very transactional. So uh, when he came into office, the, the the new and the number one threat was their ability to reach us with intercontinental ballistic missiles. And if he can cut a deal on that and on um, a portion of the nuclear bombs, that's arguably and not incorrectly further than any other previous president has gotten and it might just be enough for him. Right. I mean, the, the, probably in that regard, the most worrying thing to me personally was when he came back from Singapore and landed at Andrews Air Force Base, the first thing he tweeted was, I've solved the problem already. And it's just the beginning. I mean, it's just the very beginning. And so it gives you a sense of where his head is and where he's going on this. The fig leaf over the top of that could well be a process uh, spinning off into the indefinite future about short to medium range missiles and the rest of the nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. So we can save, I've solved it for America now. Right. American people, please vote for me. Um, I'm sorry about this, South Korea and Japan and all allies elsewhere, tough, but we've got a process which will finish sometime in the 22nd century yeah. uh, over yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, explain what that would cause, Kevin, the uh, US allies or other countries in the region who would not be susceptible uh, to that um, uh, language, who wouldn't believe him, um, and who would still feel threatened, what kinds of actions would they then take in response to that? The thing that's always frightened me most about the North Korean nuclear capability is where it spins to over time in terms of nuclear proliferation more widely yeah. across the Asia-Pacific region, which is already uh, Asia spends more on its military than Europe does. So uh, when you're starting to look at uh, a map which shows where military hardware exists in the world, it's rapidly become a trans-Pacific map rather than a transatlantic map in terms of the aggregation of, let's call it, military capabilities. 
And in the region, we also have a whole lot of unresolved territorial questions as well. Now, over the top of that, you then have uh, an unresolved uh, nuclear question concerning the north. What do other regional states then do in response to the scenario we've just described if you're cut, high and le cut and left high and dry by your American ally? Mm -hmm. Victor will be able to speak better in terms of how this will unfold in South Korean politics. Uh, it will depend on who's the government of South Korea at a particular time. The centre-left and the centre-right there will have different perspectives on this. But prior to this uh, summitry occurring, there was already support in South Korean opinion polls to the level of 67% of South Korea obtaining its own nuclear capability. Now, flip to Japan, which has its post-war uh, constitution, mm -hmm. and, um, and Abe-san's uh, 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 attitude to normalising Japan as a post-war international power and military power, um, I think what it does over time in Japan is it builds a much stronger impetus towards Japan beginning to consider medium term its own nuclear option as well. And no one should be under any illusions about how quick a process it is for advanced um, industrial economies like, frankly, Japan, South Korea, Australia, to become nuclear within a matter of months, if that's what you wanted to do. We choose not to for a whole range of other reasons. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, th th and this raises an um, interesting point, but we don't, which we don't have the answer to, but it's worth raising, which is, you know, is President Trump in dealing with this North Korea issue, is ultimately, is his goal to actually try to solve the problem in terms mm -hmm. of complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization? <clears throat> or is it to half solve the problem, declare peace, and then get out, right? Um, um, the president's views on, for example, U.S. troops in Korea, we have 28,500 U.S. troops in Korea, uh, going back to the 1990s has been very clear. Mm -hmm. He doesn't understand why we have them there, why we pay uh, half, the bi half the annual bill, the South Koreans pay the other half of keeping them there. Um, <clears throat> and, and so I, I, I worry a little bit about that, but at the same time, I can understand intuitively the argument. Right, which is, this is what the, the North Koreans have developed an incredibly large nuclear weapons program that is buried deep in thousands of miles of tunnels that we will never be able to permanently dismantle unless we occupy the country with 350,000 troops. Um, and we don't want to do that. Um, and in the meantime, they are advancing capabilities and now directly threaten us. So I can, there is, some, there is a logic there to why the president may want to meet the leader, become friends with him, invite him to Mar-a-Lago, you know, declare peace, get some sort of freeze, and then get out of Dodge so that it's not a U.S. problem anymore. And lifting of sanctions would be a part of this as well, and that would bring Congress into the question. They've been very accommodating to the president, but would there, could there be a situation in which he says, because to, for the narrative you just sketched out, he'd have to lift sanctions, Right. And, and so would that be a possible problem in the U.S.? Um, yes. I mean, the, 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 the sanctions on North Korea right now are for two specific things, the nuclear weapons and proliferation as well as human rights abuses. So, and Congress has not only, um, uh, has not only supported the sanctions, uh, they've actually passed legislation, law, that requires the president to uh, continue to have these sanctions on without... Uh, um, verifiable evidence that there has been a change in the situation. In an ironic twist, apparently the North Koreans are actually now interested in negotiating an agreement with the United States that would have to be ratified by our Congress, uh, largely because they are of the view after 25 years of negotiation with us that they get one president who makes a deal, then there's a midterm election or there's a presidential election, and then the next president doesn't want that deal anymore. And so in a bizarre twist of fate, it's the North Koreans who may want something ratifiable um, rather than our administration. Paying attention to the Iranian model. <laughs> um, yeah. Kevin, when uh, you were prime minister and, and um, foreign minister, what was your dealings with? What were they like with North Korea? I'm still wrestling, by the way, with the mental picture of uh, <laughs> Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un in a jacuzzi in Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> 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 That's, that's going to stay with me for a while. <clears throat> I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. Yeah. 
Well, and, and of course, Dennis Rodman. So. Oh, yeah, we'll add him to the... Okay. There you go. It's, uh, it's better than reality TV. Yeah, right. Look, uh, I go back to what I said before. This is uh, an ugly Leninist state. I mean, we pretend... That's no, we don't pretend. Some pretend that we're dealing with... Um, uh, a country which is uh, emerging from the shadows of its authoritarian past. Uh, it's not. There's a brilliant report done by former Justice of the Australian High Court on behalf of the United Nations Human Rights Council, uh, Justice Kirby, on human rights uh, abuses in North Korea. It's comprehensive, it's not polemical, it's just factual and done with a judicial lens. Uh, and it's horrific uh, as a piece of reading. Um, and, uh, and the Human Rights Council, I think, has done great work in advancing uh, the cause of human rights in North Korea to keep it on the agenda in the international community. So let's never forget that that's what they're like. I've been to, only, I've been to North Korea twice, uh, but not as either a Prime Minister or as a Foreign Minister. I've been as a Member of Parliament. And, and I don't know what Victor's impressions are, but uh, what struck me when I visited is how effective the regime has been in insulating its people uh, from uh, any form of reality check about what the rest of the world is actually thinking and doing. If you've lived in George Orwell's 1984 since 1945, really, uh, then let me tell you, it's a very strange world. Uh, and I'm a student of China, so when I went, first went to North Korea in 2000, I think, it reminded me of what I'd read China was like in the Cultural Revolution. I, mean, I didn't know China in the Cultural Revolution, but what I'd read it was like. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and the uh, preparedness to use force um, to achieve political ends is the first impulse of a Leninist regime which holds power through the barrel of a gun. Mm -hmm. So I think we should be under no illusions that you're not dealing with a bunch of people who have just you know, had a come to Jesus moment in Singapore. Victor, in your, and then we're going to open this up for questions. Victor, in your negotiations with the North Koreans, is there a pattern to their behavior? Is there a particular North Korean way at these, at the six party talks or in your? That um, <clears throat> so um, when I started going to these, I was warned that they were going to be very aggressive and take off their shoe and bang the table like Khrushchev or something. <laughs> But actually, they weren't. I mean, they were professional diplomats from their American Affairs Bureau who were negotiating. Um, you know, they had the, we had our instructions, they had their instructions. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it was, very, it was very professional. Occasionally, it would get heated every now and then, but, uh, but it got heated when we negotiated with our allies as well. The one thing that did strike me was, and it was contrary to what I expected, is that in these sorts of negotiations, as some of you in the audience know, the teams come together and initially you have your instructions and you negotiate, but you quickly get to the end of your instructions. <laughs> and then there's some imp imp improvising that takes place, but then you have to go back to capitals overnight to see if what you've done is okay to yeah. get to the next step. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, um, I mean, so our, we were very focused on this negotiation and so we had direct lines to the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, and the President to get either a yes or no on what we wanted to do. And we thought in the North Korean case, you know, it's gotta be pretty easy. There's only one guy who's making decisions. And surprisingly enough, they were the slowest. It took them the longest time to get instructions back. The Chinese came back right away. This was at six party talks. The Japanese did, the South Koreans, even the Russians came back right away. And we would have to wait an extra two days or three days for the North Koreans, oh. which was... This is under Kim Jong-il. This is under Kim Jong-il. Um, so with, uh, so I, I thought that that was interesting. But the other thing I thought was interesting is on the sidelines, they would ask, because their job is to study the United States, they would ask lots of questions about our politics. Oh. So back then they were asking, like, do you think Hillary Clinton will actually run for president? You know, they had all sorts of questions about our politics, which I thought was, were, were, were quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, all right, let's, let's open it up to questions. Here's one to start. And we've got a microphone is making its way down to you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I have a question for Victor. Um, Victor, we haven't talked about conventional weapons. What would you think about 
a, an outline of a deal that might look like where there was a partial reduction of nuclear weapons, but as you know, the North Koreans have a significant conventional um, army, uh, tanks, artillery right on the South Korea border. How would you feel about some kind of, uh, I'll say, broader outline of a peace treaty, redu significant reduction of conventional weapons, and partial reduction of nuclear weapons? Yeah. Um, so. There, yes, there are different ways to, so if this is about tension reduction, there are different ways to, you know, to cut this. And one of them would be not just to look at the weapons of mass destruction, but also focus on conventional weapons. I mean, this is the most militarized border in the world, bar none. And if any objective military analyst were looking, staring overhead at North Korea's military positions, this looks like a country that's ready to go to, go to war right away. So the, the, there have been proposals that they should pull back their artillery, for example. The warning time for a North Korean artillery shell into the city of Seoul, 20 million people, is less than 30 seconds. Um, um, so pulling that back, um, both sides pulling back might be part of a broader, uh, a, a broader plan. And I think the South Koreans in particular are focusing on the conventional side of this. Um, but again, the big question really for our president and our own politics is whether some sort of partial deal on nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles would be enough, given that we've, hold, we've held out the standard of CVID, right, complete, verified, meaning everything, and given the fact that we walked away from the Iran deal, which was, um, which was 120 pages and several hundred pages of annexes, and the Singapore joint statement is four sentences. But very, it, it's very small font, so it's really <laughs> <laughs> um, Over here. Thanks, very informative. Uh, the point that I think both of you made, or maybe it was Victor, was uh, that uh, Kim had not left the country for seven years and that he's done all these visits with China and South Korea and now the President of the United States. Um, do you think that that was um, because of the President Trump's bellicose rhetoric or was, is there something else going on inside of this country? Or is it a little of both? Um, um, so this North Korean leader took power when he was 28 years old. Right? His father suffered, a there have only been three leaders. His father suffered a massive heart attack and, uh, and he had to take over at 28 years old. And so he, was com he stayed completely within his shell, cl completely within North Korea for seven or eight years. His father actually didn't travel much either. His father ruled the country from 1994 to, what was it, 20, 2010? 10, 2010, 11. 2010, 11. Um, and he didn't travel much either. So this has been in a long tradition of North Korean dictators who live in their own little, they call it Chuche ideology, self-reliance ideology. Um, and. Uh, the grandfather, so it's like the grandfather, the father, and the son. It's like the mafia, right? The grandfather, the father, and the son. The grandfather did travel a lot more, but that was during the Cold War, where he could go to the Soviet Union. He was good friends with Ceausescu in Romania, with Honecker, um, um, but that was a completely different time. So um, this was not, so you could argue that uh, President Trump and the South Korean President Moon helped to bring the North Korean leader out of his shell starting particularly from the Olympics in February when they attended the Olympics. And you remember the North Korean leader sent his little sister um, to, to, to South Korea. But at the same time, you could also argue that in December, as I said, they believed they had completed their you know, five decades plus quest to become a nuclear weapon state and were now ready to come out to the world on the basis of that. So. Yes. Um, about the possibility of unification and also how, with the opening up of North Korea, how is the population of North Korea going to be get re, going to get re-educated? Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, as many of you know, Koreans never asked to be divided. Uh, they were a united country for thousands of years, even though the last time they were united was under Japanese occupation. and. As a result of the Cold War, the U.S. and the Soviets decided to divide the peninsula for occupation purposes. Um, <clears throat> unification, I think, by all accounts, would be very difficult. Um, the, most, um, the closest example is Germany. And across almost any metric in terms of uh, 
relative economic gaps, size of the population to be absorbed, relative isolation from the rest of the world, much more severe in North Korea than for East Germany. Across almost any metric, this is going to be much harder um, than it would. Um, North Koreans don't know a lot about the outside world, but they are 100% literate. They have a 100% literacy rate. But we can see from the North Koreans who defect to South Korea and to the United States uh, that it's, it's difficult. I mean, they are thrown into a situation, even with transitional um, training and things provided by the government, where they end up, uh, relatively speaking, sort of lowest average income in the country, highest dropout rate from schools, um, uh, higher percentage uh, get involved in criminal activities. It's not easy coming from a system like North Korea and then integrating into South Korea, which, as some of you know, is like one of the most fastest paced uh, cities in the world. So there are lots of, there are definitely lots of challenges. There. Right here, this gentleman. You have stated quite um, clearly that you believe the chances of getting a complete CVID uh, from the North Koreans are nil. That makes sense to me and I think most people. Uh, my question is, is there any possibility that the Chinese would share our strategic objective of CVID? And if that were true, could that change the conclusion you came to? My calculation about that is no. Um, I don't think um, the Chinese do not like to see nuclear weapons proliferation as a matter of general policy. Um, but uh, in the period since they've known the North Koreans are developing a capability, and given their ability to apply direct bilateral means, um, not, in other words, cutting off oil supplies, uh, to induce a change in behaviour in Pyongyang, uh, they would have done that decades ago. And they haven't done so. Secondly, I think my view is that whereas it's as a matter of general policy undesirable to have more nuclear weapons in your own region, the baseline Chinese calculus is that whatever North Korea has won't be pointed at them. Okay? Um, and then the third point is this. Um, therefore, if you were one of the hardheads in the, in the People's Liberation Army uh, sitting out at the National Defence University in Beijing, where I've gone to give lectures from time to time, and you sit with all the hardheads out there. Their overall view, this is not the foreign policy establishment, uh, would be something like, well, this just gives a bigger headache for the Americans and our allies in the region. Mm -hmm. So in aggregate correlation of forces type logic, uh, this is on balance uh, compatible with China's longer term strategic interest of just seeing the United States diminished as a strategic power in East Asia and the West Pacific. So I do not think they are singing from the same hymn sheet yeah. on CVID for those reasons. Yeah. Interesting. Um, there's one over there in the purple, I think, lavender. So this will have to be our last one. Kim is getting a lot of visitors from Syria and Russia and China. If things do come to fruition, who benefits economically? Does the United States benefit, or who does North Korea turn to? <clears throat> well, I think um, President Trump has made pretty clear that he'll, he'd be happy to make the deal, but he's not paying for any of it. Um, <clears throat> and for this reason, you know, it would most likely be the South Koreans uh, the Japanese, I, I don't know how Kevin feels, I, th I think the Chinese will also, could also probably play a role, particularly on infrastructure. I oh, don't yeah. know how you feel about that. But, um, totally. yeah. Um, and so they will, I mean, they will all be doing these things not simply as handouts. I mean, they will benefit from it as well, whether it's in terms of South Korean business investment in the North or others. Um, your, your point about the Russians and the Syrians I mean, this is obviously concerning, and it was not by coincidence, I think, that just before Kim Jong-un was to go to Singapore to meet with President Trump, you know, the, 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 he, there was an announcement that the Syrians would like to come to Pyongyang. I mean, I don't think it, that's just by accident. It's showing that 
North Korea has cards to play too. And as you know well, they've had a long relationship with countries like Iran and Syria and others um, in the Middle East. Um, so there, is, there will always continually be the concern about proliferation there. Um, North Korea is one of the worst proliferators in the world. And this is where I'm, you know, so I'm, this is where I'm always so conflicted about Donald Trump because on the one hand, I think that he doesn't, he's just looking for a way out of this problem. On the other hand, I think that if he's trying to really befriend the North Korean leader and the North Korean leader says, look, I'm not gonna proliferate to Syria, if you say that when we're just negotiating nuclear weapons, and they've said that to us, when you're just negotiating nuclear weapons to that, with them, and they go, yeah, look, we won't proliferate to Syria, you kind of take that as a threat, you know? It's like, if you don't work with us, we're gonna proliferate to Syria. But if, you know, Trump brings the guy to Mar-a-Lago and they're in the jacuzzi together with Dennis Rodman smoking cigars, and he says, look, I'm not gonna proliferate to but Syria. Cigars, yeah. Right, yeah, then, then you know, maybe there's more to it than that. So, you know, I mean, but like again, the, the bottom line is that we still have a lot of details to fill in and again, compared to where we were last year, and I had a pretty good view on what was going on last year, I was really worried that we were headed towards a war in Korea. And so we gotta give this, as flawed as the process may look, we gotta give it a chance and see what will happen over the next six months to a year. All right, thank you, Victor. Kevin, thanks so much. That's great. Thanks. Thanks.